Thank you so much, Ernesto. Um, I hope you can hear me. If at any point the signal goes out, just shout at me. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with all of you, um, albeit in this remote format. Um, I'm thoroughly impressed with your technical setup that you have people in the room, people on Zoom. We'll have to try to imitate that uh, here where, where I work. Um, so in addition to thanking uh, Ernesto, I wanna thank Bill, Leah, and the entire staff at LAX uh, at Cornell for making today's talk possible. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank um, someone that Ernesto just mentioned, um, Professor Maria Cristina Garcia um, from Cornell. Um, not only has her work been pioneering in the field in which I work, but she was a reader for my manuscript uh, with UNC Press. So I would not be here today if it wasn't for her um, and her judicious, encouraging comments uh, helped make this book that I'm going to be talking about today um, a better one. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. And hopefully you can all see that. Um, and so I want to start my presentation of the book by, by reading uh, a little bit, I promise just a short amount from the, the opening. Now, the book begins uh, like so. There are two widely familiar versions of the Cuban story. According to the first, on January 1st, 1959, a ragtag band of rebels swept down from the Sierra Maestra delivering Cuba from the clutches of short-term dictatorship and longer neo-colonial neo -colonial submission to the United States. In this view, the triumph of the Cuban revolution marked the definitive end of one period of the island's history, nearly six decades of quote unquote pseudo Republican scandal following the island's mortgaged independence in 1902 and the beginning of true liberty under the banner of revolutionary change. The second version of the saga accepts its rival's chronological pivot point, 1959, but it inverts the order of praise. In the alternate tale, the Cuban revolution, um, it represented not a fulfillment of nationalist dreams, but an unmitigated tragedy. For many of those who left the island in the 1960s, Cuba's turn to socialism made the pre-revolutionary period look like paradise lost, transforming their homeland into an island in chains. Now in Havana, in Miami, and in the many coordinates of Cuba's far-flung diaspora around the globe, these dueling master narratives are still routinely on display. More than 60 years after Fidel Castro's rise to power and more than four since his death, diametrically opposed accounts of Cuba's past continue to square off in competing public spaces, monuments, and now even social media campaigns. But dig beneath either iteration of the tale and less streamlined or comfortable narratives of Cuba's history emerge. In reality, Cubans' arguments about their past and the ways they have related to that past since 1959 have never been so straightforward or stable. It may be tempting to reduce Cubans' battles over their history to a standoff between one set of voices shouting from Revolution Square in Havana and another positioned atop Miami's literal and figurative Freedom Tower. But if popular visions of the Cuban Revolution's legacies today often seem polarized, that polarization in fact conceals more nuanced viewpoints and it is the result of political processes that were and continue to be anything but neat. So, so begins the book setting the stage I hope for all that follows. And in some 200 uh, pages and six chapters, Cuban Memory Wars endeavors to tell the history or perhaps I should say a history of Cubans as Ernesto was saying, I think quoting from, from the book itself, mobilizations of reckonings with and debates over their past during the Cuban Revolution's crucial first 20 years in power. I've long been fascinated by the prominent place that competing understandings of the island's history occupy in everyday Cuban political cultures. So this book attempts to elucidate, in a sense, the longer trajectory of those disagreements, revealing that Cubans' competing selective remembrances, to borrow a phrase from the historian Steve Stern, uh, have, neither been strict, have never, neither been static nor strictly cyclical over time. So put simply, the book argues that prominent struggles over history and memory within, between, and beyond the synagogical cities of Havana and Miami didn't just fuel enduring contests over what it meant to be Cuban. They were also central to the course of Cuban history itself. One only has to look to the first months following Fidel Castro's rise to power to see how history and memory emerged as prominent battlegrounds and languages on and through which revolutionary officials, cultural producers, 
and diverse political actors endeavored to invest Cuban citizens in specific understandings of the revolution's origins and, or, and purpose as a national quest. Disagreements, however, over precisely how and why the revolution came to be, which factions should shape its future, and ultimately whether its promises were fulfilled, sparked competitions for historical prerogative that really never went away and with which Cubans have been dealing ever since. So drawing upon uh, rare press, uh, personal correspondence, visual media, and to a lesser extent, oral history, I try to track such tensions as they developed in Cuba and trailed those Cubans decamping to the United States um, over the first 20 years of the revolution uh, being in power. As Cubans on the island navigated the promises and perils of a socialist regime, and as those who became disenchanted with the revolutionary government fled into exile, they regularly reflected upon what happened, why, what happened, why, and how to further propel or for some reverse history's course. Now, this book is certainly not the first to note the salience of the past to Cubans' political presence. Lillian Guerra, one of my mentors, has excavated in her excellent um, uh, book, Visions of Power, uh, quote, how the grand narrative of the emerging Cuban revolutionary state gave mass participation in the revolutionary process, meaning, end quote, uh, chiefly in the 1960s. And her work has been absolutely foundational to my understanding of these issues. Nor am I the first to think about the histories of the Cuban revolution and the Cuban exile community relationally. So in addition to highlighting Maria Cristina Garcia's pioneering study of the Cuban exile community, Havana, USA, which was also foundational um, to my own education in these themes, I also want to highlight the work of Nena Torres um, as the idea of Miami and Cuba existing in a shared land of mirrors, as she calls it um, in her book, uh, is important. And I should also say, uh, Professor uh, de los Angeles Torres was the other reader of my manuscript, so I'm indebted to her as well. But I'd like to think that my book builds on this previous scholarship by offering uh, perhaps more textured, culturally inflected, and fine-grained exploration of the politics of the past in an evolving Cuban present and in real time. It does so not by focusing so much on representations of history strictly in monuments, museums, or public spaces, although those venues are of interest to me uh, as well, but more on the main mundane stages, public and private, where divergent appreciations of and anxieties about the Cuban past were routinely on display. So I'm talking about the speeches of political leaders, dueling editorials in the Cuban and Cuban exile press, organizational records, correspondence, and cultural texts like television, cartoons, song, and film. By bringing to bear such a diversity of materials, I hope readers will appreciate the breadth of the actors involved in the Cuban memory wars, as well as the multiple ways the specter of the Cuban past as inspiration, trauma, keenly felt epic, or at a certain point, repetitive official script pervaded so many aspects of post-1959 Cuban and Cuban diasporic life. So to begin telling this story, I had to confront a, a paradox, namely why on earth would history matter so much if the Cuban revolution as a project devoted to bringing about a utopian future was so infested in, 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 invested in leaving the past behind? And the answer goes beyond the power of short-term contrast. On the one hand, it's true, the image of a shameful before under the rule of Fulgento Batista reinforced the premise and promise of a revolutionary after. But on the other hand, the victory of diverse revolutionary forces in 1959 channeled longer held nationalist dreams. There's an essay I often turn to by the scholar Damian Fernandez um, in which he characterizes Cuban history as moving through re repetitive cycles of quote, desire and disenchantment. Now that idea may seem too conveniently alliterative uh, or even a tad reductionist, but I think he helps us understand the ways Cuba's history seems to be full of so many uh, foundational and serial what if moments. What if the United States had not intervened in Cuba's war for independence in 1898 or at another, a number of other points thereafter? What if uh, Cuban national independence hero Jose Marti hadn't died before that? Um, what if the quote unquote revolution in Cuba of 1930 to 1933 against the Machado government had proved more lasting? What if the quote unquote democratic spring of Cuba's 1940s wasn't marred by corruption? Um, what if Batista himself hadn't staged uh, a coup in 1952 coming back to power for in fact the second time in Cuban history? 
The point that I'm trying to make is that by the 1950s, there was a very wide strain in Cuban political culture that saw the island's history and destiny as somehow being unfulfilled. And this new revolution that was taking shape um, as the chance to not only overthrow a government, the government of Fuente Batista, but as the chance to end this cycle of serial disappointment one for all, once and for all. So put another way, what the Cuban scholar Maria del Pilar Diaz Castañón uh, evocatively calls the ahora sí, or now finally impulse in Cuban political psychology, you can see it here, literally on display in a, in a, a cartoon from uh, the very beginning of 1959, that this political psychology was um, everywhere, sort of in the air, as revolutionary forces took power in 1959. Cuba's myth of subjunctive possibility, as Diaz Castañón calls it at another point, uh, cried out to be fulfilled. The problem uh, was that evaluations of the revolution after that point would not only be informed by discussions uh, about and shared understandings of what preceded it, including legacies of state violence under the Batista government, nor did they revolve simply around how to commemorate heroes of and award credit for victory in the anti-Batista fight, a complicated set of memory battles in their own right, given the number of factions involved. What happened after the revolution took power also rapidly became grist for the retrospective mill. Events subsequent to the quote unquote triumph, as well as the revolution's broader political, economic, and social results, either provided evidence that el proceso or the process was fulfilling its historic mandate, falling short or worse, betraying its true goals. And of course, just what those true goals were would prove to be another contentious point in Cuban retrospective debate, especially in the pages of the Cuban press in 1959 through 1960. Now, the omnipresence of the past in the case of the Cuban exile community is perhaps easier to explain. Those who found themselves in disagreement with the direction that the revolution took and felt pressured directly and indirectly to flee the country naturally felt a need to articulate some kind of shared understanding of the experiences of uprooting they had endured and where the revolution had gone wrong. So the political identity of the early exile community found an anchor in common experiences and memories of displacement, property and business confiscations, and worse, state violence, and of course, nostalgia for a country left behind, as you can see reflected in this uh, magazine cover. The difficulty, though, was that Cuban exiles after 1959 also brought complex political legacies and baggage with them to the United States in their own right. And while they shared much in common, most obviously in opposition to the Castro government, they also found reason to fiercely debate who among them may have been complicit in the nation's predicament and what had led to Fidel Castro's path to victory in the first place. And this was all complicated by the fact that many had been supporters of the revolution initially. So longing for a quote unquote lost Cuba provided only a kind of partial memory salve. And, and as an example of this, I would highlight the contradiction between a magazine cover like this, which is sort of an unqualified um, nostalgia, this idea of, Cu of Cuba as a paradise lost, right? With a cartoon like this from the same publication. And yet, which suggests, you can see on the left, there's an image uh, from July, 1959. So seven months into the revolution being in power, ostensibly what's happening on the, the left side of this image is still a good thing. And yet by the mid 1960s, the image reflected on the right, um, the revolution has become something that uh, according to the perspective of this cartoonist, nobody ever wanted. And yet this image does suggest that a revolution was necessary right, which would suggest that, in fact, before the revolution, not all was so peachy keen as this image suggests, right? So there's, this is an interesting kind of foundational tension in the memory culture of the exile community that I explore uh, in some detail. So these then are, are some of the stories and cultural processes that I endeavor to trace in the book um, at their origin point in the 1960s and throughout that decade, but also as they evolved and trailed Cubans into the revolutions um, second decade, especially as Cubans look back in later years on both sides of the Florida Straits with more skeptical and not just celebratory eyes on the revolution's formative years, hardened by um, experience since. And especially too, as a new generation came of age and faced pressure on the island and in exile to assume these foundational stories and debates about the revolution as their own. And I would just highlight, you know, a way to give you a, as a way to give you a, a, a glance into the book's scope, um, you know, some of the kinds of materials I deal with. Um, on the one hand, you know, looking at earlier, uh, early uh, 
expressions of popular culture like this uh, cartoon booklet, which very early on kind of solidifies a, a memory narrative of the revolution as, um, as kind of a morality tale um, to this political cartoon from uh, early, pretty early on in 1959, but gives us an insight into some of the early memory battles that were happening within the revolutionary fold. This is an image that shows um, basically a bunch of uh, guys in suits um, uh, who look decidedly middle-aged showing up to the new uh, institutions of the revolutionary government claiming that they had some kind of a history of revolutionary loyalty, right? So this is about this kind of uh, notion of, of revolutionary pretenders that were inventing histories for themselves to be able to fit in to the new order, right? And so here, you know, you've got um, people who can buy literally uh, little um, sort of armbands to show their affiliation with revolutionary movements as if, it's, as if they're, they're inventing a memory of revolutionary participation for themselves. Um, to mirror images of this kind of factional memory uh, uh, feud in the exile community. Um, as uh, this, this poem um, is, is a good example, it's a comedic poem in which basically um, somebody sees at the doors of the Cuban Refugee Center in Miami, uh, waiting in line to get federal assistance as an anti-communist refugee, someone who had sung the praises of the revolution insist in, you know, insistently um, until very recently, right? So this is this other, uh, tension that exists in the memory politics of the exile community between folks who are saying, I came here first, I, I sort of don't have um, as much complicity, and you supported the thing longer. What's your past in Cuba, and were you more complicit in this thing that the revolution became than, than me? Um, I, I track these kind of ongoing debates about Cuban memory and history to moments like the Bay of Pigs invasion. And one of the little known uh, stories about the Bay of Pigs invasion actually transpires after when those members of the exile invading brigade famously supported by the CIA were taken prisoner and put on national television and essentially interrogated, but in this interesting format where there was a kind of televised debate. And, and so you have the prisoners and revolutionary government affiliated journalists who are arguing about Cuba's very recent history uh, for a national audience. Um, and then I move to the late 1960s and think about how through the culture, through the lens of of, of culture and cultural texts like the famous Cuban movie, Memorias de Sun Desarrollo, which is set in the, in the early 1960s, but filmed later on, we can see, uh, again, as I was suggesting a few minutes ago, examples of Cuban artists who, while, with, 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 while working within the restrictions of a state controlled media landscape, are looking back with a bit more um, suspicion, I, I, would, I, I would say, uh, to that earlier history that they have just lived. Um, and then finally, I, I track these stories further into the 1970s, um, into the emergence of youth exile organizations and communities in the 1970s that are having to kind of try to make the history their own in some ways. Um, and I can say more about this in the Q&A if there's interest, um, to the way in which on the island itself, the 70s is this very interesting and understudied period in which all of the big changes that the revolution is supposed to have brought have already been consummated. And so in popular media in socialist Cuba in the 1970s, it is as if audiences are constantly reliving the epic history of the 1960s because there's nothing as, as pressing taking place um, in, their, in their present day. Um, and so the point that I want to make is that, um, you know, if I convince readers of one thing, I hope it's that uh, these Cuban memory wars in all of their diverse manifestations became one of the defining fronts of the Cuban conflict itself. Um, and that's, that's how I see it. Um, so I'm gonna do something that maybe my editor wouldn't want me to do, um, but I, I feel a responsibility to do, which is to own up to what I see as some of the, the limitations of, of this book and the challenges that I faced in writing it. Um, and I'll just name, name three. I mean, one, you know, I, I couldn't purport to cover all subjects, uh, events, or individuals around which the Cuban memory wars have turned. Right? It, it would have been too much to take on. Um, as I already said, this is a, a book that has a chronological limitation, right? It studies the Cuban memory wars really, for the most part, during the first 20 years. Um, so that's a limitation in and of itself. But for example, there's a rich kind of history of Cubans arguing over the legacy of somebody like Che Guevara. Right? Was he a good guy? Was he a bad guy? Et cetera. And I really didn't include that as just one example in my book, in part because it's something that other people have written about. Right? So I tried to really focus on, I think, underappreciated stories. But I'm conscious of the fact that there are also things that folks reading this book will, will probably think that I left out. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. 
Um, the other thing that I want to say is that I think one of the ways in which the Cuban memory wars are often depicted, I think particularly outside of Cuba, is in a way that kind of puts the diaspora and the island against one another as antagonists, where the island is the base of quote unquote official history of a government that does in fact construct a kind of unified tale of the revolution's emergence over time as a way to ground its own claims to legitimacy and there and, and hides certain inconvenient parts of its own history and that those inconvenient parts those counter memories are the things that the exile community preserves i think there's a lot of truth to that but on the other hand that doesn't negate the responsibility and the um, the importance of deconstructing the Cuban exile community's own memory narratives, their own inclusions and exclusions in their own way of thinking about Cuba's recent history. All acts of memorialization are partial and involve certain forms of erasure. And so I think it's important to kind of break down um, that, 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 uh, that ostensible way of, of, of talking about um, the duality between quote unquote official history and counter official, and counter -official history in and outside of the island. And the last thing that I would say is that, you know, this is a book that, I think I, I faced a, a real challenge in trying to get at the histories of subaltern communities, I'll call them in Cuba, whether it's Cubans of color, uh, Cuban women, LGBT Cubans to not only tell their stories, but to get their stories to count as part of the uh, sort of a collective historical narrative. Um, and in the end, I found that including that part of the Cuban memory wars was really something that was beyond the scope of this book, in part because of the very problematic color and gender blind language in which I think I would argue the predominant um, spheres of the Cuban memory wars were kind of um, the, the, way, the ways in which the Cuban memory wars, I think, in most instances were channeled through that kind of color blind and gender blind language. And so the my inability in this book to account for some of that and to fit it in within the scope of the study is sadly, I would argue, a reflection of um, the terms in which the debate over the Cuban memory wars was framed for so long and uh, the, the archives, frankly, that they left behind. Um, but despite um, these challenges and limitations, and here you can just see a table of contents of the book, I'm proud of what the book covers and, and what it achieves. Uh, because between 1959 and 1979, I show the past helped Cubans orient themselves amid but also critically evaluate extraordinary junctures of hope, crisis, and change. And I believe that tracking not just the mirror images of these processes on both sides of the Florida Straits, but in fact, the interplay between them, albeit implicitly sometimes, helps to push Cuban history beyond the dualistic visions we associate with either side of those Florida Straits. And it exposes the contradictions of and connections between both. And yet, more than just tracking the ins and outs of Cuban retrospective politics, this book also, I think, unavoidably intervenes in the Cuban memory wars in its own right. That is, in historicizing the course of Cubans' debates over and reckonings with their past across the revolution's first two decades, I found myself often recovering significant junctures, processes, textures, and statements from Cuban history or from the memory wars themselves that were erased from official, quasi-official, or otherwise pretty well-known iterations of Cuban history uh, and, and historical memory subsequently. And so I cannot dare to predict that this book will enter into feedback loops with contemporary manifestations of the cultural and political processes it, de it describes above all because it's, it's in English. Um, but I'd be lying if I said that I didn't harbor some kind of hope of reshaping the contours of the Cuban memory wars and Cuban retrospective politics uh, in some way. Um, and I think at the very least, um, what I hope is that this book offers the possibility of an alternate narrative of Cuban history, a, a narrative in which Cubans battles over their history since 1959, not just their divergent experiences of it, become part of um, our collective memory uh, uh, as, a, as a people. And I should say here, I say our because I'm Cuban American. So I said that um, I was gonna, uh, well, I wanna say something about why I chose to end this book's inquiry when I did um, in 1979. And that's because that year, um, for the first time uh, since they left, albeit with few exceptions, some of which I cover in the book, Cuban exiles were allowed to go back to the island to visit. And 100,000 did so in the span of a, a, you know, one year. 
And the result, I argue, was an important memory encounter between Cubans that ironically is scarcely accounted for in most um, Cuban history books in its own right. As veritable apparitions from the past, returning exiles disrupted the distortions through which revolutionary discourse had framed their memory, the memory of the departed uh, to that point. And yet visitors also encountered a Cuba that had moved on without them, uh, was more than a black box and where their nostalgias often had little place. And so that year, uh, 1979, I would say, brings us full, full circle in a way as after that point with the outbreak of the Mariel Boatlift in 1980, these cycles of exodus and narrative fracture begin again. Um, but of course, the, the story of the Cuban memory wars does not stop in 1979. So in the conclusion to the book, I do attempt to synthetically bring the story um, up to date. And needless to say, the memory politics around the 1980 Mariel Boatlift, by which 125,000 Cubans came to the United States, are fascinating in their own right, because in so many ways it became an episode that I would say both sides of the Florida Straits um, would prefer to forget. Um, indeed, it's remarkable though I shouldn't say indeed, I would say, I should say notwithstanding that, um, that trauma that, that the Mario Boltlip represented, it's remarkable to me how many Cubans look back on the, the early 1980s as, uh, you know, through a prism of socialist nostalgia, as a time of relative openness and abundance and a certain critical cross possibility. So shortly after a major traumatic event like the Mario Boltlip. But any sense of that kind of critical possibility that I think some Cubans remember um, as, as having been part of their experience in the 1980s would come crashing down by the next decade um, as Cuba entered its quote unquote special period um, following the fall of the Soviet Union, which represented a crisis, not just economically, but for the memory armature of the Cuban state like no other, especially as Cuba found itself paradoxically selling the revolution as a kind of memory commodity while at the same time seeking tourist dollars by indulging in nostalgic longings for the 1950s, the same nostalgia that remained a hallmark of the revolution's opponents in Miami. Um, and yet the, mm -hmm. the special period represented a memory crisis for the exile community too, I would argue, when Cuba proved not to be the next communist domino to fall and exile's own perceived historical deliverance was denied. Um, and just backpedaling a little bit, I would just highlight this other work of art about kind of the, 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 the memory contradictions of that moment in Cuba in the 1990s, where you have a, a state that still insists we're forward moving, the revolution is living on, to the past we will never return, as is the title of this, this work of art. And yet clearly what Cuba is selling to the world and selling to tourists as a, as a strategy out of the crisis is this notion of Cuba as a kind of a time capsule, um, as is you know, parodied in very dark tones by the artist Pedro Alvarez. I, I end the book though, reflecting on more contemporary dynamics um, from the effects of the Obama normalization moment on the Cuban memory landscape, uh, a time when Cuba's history of all kinds seemed to be at the risk of being silenced in the island's further metamorphosis into a nostalgic theme park as satirized, I think quite brilliantly in this New Yorker cover from 2015 to the refreezing of diplomatic relations under Donald Trump and its consequent effects. Indeed, for all that the Cuban uh, landscape has produced such rich, complex meditations on history and memory in the last 20 years, in art and literature and all kinds of ways, it's been fascinating to watch a climate of renewed bilateral tension, which continues to this day, in some ways egg on a revival of the revolutionary uh, memory canon's greatest hits, right? And that's just an example, I would say, just look at this screenshot of a couple of examples of what became a prominent uh, Cuban government Twitter hashtag campaign over the last few years, hashtag tenemos memoria or hashtag we have memory, um, which memory, uh, whose memory one might ask. Um, uh, or I would say the, the, the current Cuban government's in somewhat odd claim to carrying the revolution forward uh, by appealing to historical continuidad or continuity, um, which is another, I think, uh, strange iteration of a kind of a, grabbing onto the past, even while you say you're, you're moving forward into the future. Um, so let me, let me close the talk. And then I'm very interested to hear your comments and reflections um, with, uh, uh, you know, as I started with, with some, uh, an, an excerpt from the book's uh, conclusion. Um, and I want to say, you know, I'm not sure how we are on time, but, but I, you know, having finished this book when I did, and if any of you have been following what's been happening in Cuba over recent months, you know, I think we all wish 
that often when we finish books that we could go back and rewrite the ending. <laughs> I'm certainly one of them um, in the wake of what happened in Cuba in July 11th. Um, really, truly historic protests across the island. And I think we're all still trying to unpack and understand. And that have been interesting implications for, for Cuban memory politics. So I'll be happy to explore that in the Q&A. But let me, um, let me end with some lines from a, a section of the book uh, called Forever, um, Forever Memory Wars. The Cuban Revolution came to power in 1959 as a broad uh, political front, uniting Cubans of diverse backgrounds and political persuasions around an overwhelming push for change. Yet if one objective drew the population to insurgent leaders, it was the hope of breaking the cycles of, quote, desire and disenchantment, and quote, to which Cuban history had for so long appeared condemned. 60 years later, and despite all the water under the bridge, the myth of subjunctive possibility for many Cubans, the now finally of the Cuban historical imagination, I would say remains unfulfilled. Ostensibly, both diehard revolutionaries today and disillusioned Cuban emigres still want nothing more than to leave the past behind, whether to finally achieve socialism's utopia of equitable development and human solidarity, or to bring about the supposed panacea of the Cuban revolution's demise. And neither, I would say, seems um, particularly close to fulfilling their goal, notwithstanding, I would add, the events in Cuba this July. Um, today, though, one must admit that the possibilities of reaching uh, anything like common ground seem remote. The Cuban retrospective field today is full of paradox, overlapping nostalgias, the nostalgias for Cuban 1950s, the nostalgias for uh, the heyday of socialism for, for others, and more thoughtful reflections than in the past. Those who experience the beginning stages of the Cuban conflict are aging and rapidly disappearing. Yet biology provides little consolation as memory polarizations of old are recycled in fresh public echo chambers. I do not want to remember, says the main character in the novel Memorias uh, de Su Desarrollo or Memories of Underdevelopment from uh, 19, uh, the early 1960s, which became a famous 1968 film. I do not want to have inconsolable, inconsolable memories. For now, and maybe for the foreseeable future, I would say that Cubans appear to have little choice. So I'll end there. Um, and again, uh, thank you for your attention. 